Ladies Dress in the Early 19th Century. Join me as we take a look at women's fashion around the year 1812. In the 1790s, dress waistlines rose all the way to the bust and remained there until about 1820. This era of fashion is commonly referred to as Regency or Empire, and the Empire waistline defined the silhouette of all ladies' clothing throughout America, Europe, and the European colonies. The first layer of clothing was a shift, also called a chemise. It was usually made of fine linen, but cotton was becoming increasingly more common. Some women of the time began wearing drawers or pantalettes. Stockings were knit of silk, cotton, or wool, and stays were generally worn to maintain the high, shelf-like form of the bust popular at the time. If leaving the bedroom, all of these garments would be worn beneath a dress and outerwear. Shifts were worn to bed and as a base layer under clothing throughout the day. They separated the oils and sweat of the skin from the more expensive and often delicate garments worn atop them. Thus, they were designed to be comfortable and easily laundered. The shift's neckline was generally low to remain hidden below the dress's neckline. Many women of the period did not wear any form of what we think of today as underpants. When additional modesty or warmth was required, some women wore pantalettes. This garment was adapted as an open form of men's pantaloons. They were fastened about the waist with ties and worn beneath the shift. Stockings often came to the height of the thigh. They were held in place by a garter, often silk ribbon or cotton tape, and tied either above or below the knee. Fancier stockings included clock patterns extending from the heel up the ankle. Ladies often wore white or pastel stockings, where working women more commonly wore darker or more vivid colors. Stays were worn to lift and separate the bust. Lengths ranged from just below the bust down to the waist. Many stays fastened up the back with a single lacing, but wraparound styles emerged as well. Rather than the stiff boning seen before and after the Regency period, these softer stays often utilized cording to provide structure. A solid wooden busk, however, was often fixed in the center front to maintain the shelf-like appearance of the lifted bust, especially for larger bust lines. The top line of the stays ended at center bust, and the chemise drawstring was used to contain the bust within the stays' gussets. The next layer of clothing was the petticoat. This was worn over the stays to provide a smooth base for dresses to be worn over. Petticoats were often made of handkerchief weight linen or fine cotton muslin. They provided additional modesty when layered between the shift and dress. A petticoat maintained the silhouette of the dress's skirt while preventing it from clinging too closely to the body. Styles varied widely and were often dictated by the dress worn atop them. The simplest kind was merely a skirt pinned to the stays. Alternately, suspenders over the shoulder would hold the skirt in place under the bust. Structured or bodiced petticoats were constructed similarly to a dress and could be worn with or without sleeves. Some women would even rely on a bodice petticoat for bust support and not wear any stays at all. Though predominantly white and fairly plain, embroidered or colored petticoats would sometimes be worn below sheer net dresses popular at the time. Though the décolletage was often left exposed with evening wear, during the day the chest was frequently covered with a white garment. Various styles were worn, including chemisettes, tuckers, and the fichu. The chemisette was a sheer bodice that fastened below the bust and was worn over the petticoat. Occasionally it was worn over the dress as well. A tucker would be laid over the shoulders and simply tucked into the bodice of the dress. 
The fichu was a triangular scarf, or square scarf folded into a triangle. It was worn tucked into the bodice, left exposed in the back, or crossed over in the front and held in place with a belt or ribbon. Working women of the early 19th century wore dresses or empire-waisted short gowns paired with a skirt. Dresses were commonly made of sturdy cotton broadcloth, sometimes roller or block printed, or heavier linens. Donning the dresses was generally done by oneself without the aid of a servant, so many garments fastened in the front with ties or a wrap-over style, or were simply fitted to the frame with a drawstring. Sleeves ranged from short and blousy, to elbow length, to full length. The garments were of a sturdy construction to be easily laundered and did not generally have much ornamentation in trim or embroidery. Aprons and shawls were often worn over garments to protect them and add warmth. Colors and patterns varied widely, but block printed and roller print fabric from India was popular. The fashionable prints of the time included small floral sprigs, striped patterns, and repeating geometric shapes. Large calico floral prints were left mostly in the 18th century. Fine craftswomen tended towards the white day dresses of the time popular with their clientele. The short gown and skirt was popular with working class women. Rather than replacing an entire garment, the skirts would be more easily replaced when frayed or stained. Pairing different skirts and short gowns extended the wardrobe. Bib front or drop front dresses were a popular choice for ease of dressing and were often worn by servants and maids. The dress opened in the front with the bodice lacing or pinning together. The front part of the skirt had an extension above the waist that looked similar to an apron. It was pinned or buttoned in place on the bodice and secured around the waist with ties or drawstrings. Kept women, or women of the middle and upper classes, wore fashions that varied widely. The common theme remained the silhouette with the high waistline born from the neoclassical resurgence in the period. Dressing style often changed throughout the day between morning or day dress and evening or formal dress. The white day dress made of sheer cotton muslin or voile was very popular. This status symbol displayed wealth due to the fragile nature of the garments and their ease of staining. These dresses would be worn while working on crafts, hobbies, or music lessons indoors or outdoors during agreeable weather on light strolls or errands. It was often adorned with white work embroidery and delicate trims. Printed cotton and shot silk morning dresses were also common in a variety of closure styles, including front tie, apron front, wrap, drawstring, and back button with the aid of another set of hands. Sleeves included short poofs with detachable arm length extensions, full length sleeves, and elbow length sleeves. Again, tuckers or chemisettes were often worn with dresses during the day. Evening gowns were worn to dinner or social events and often had short, full sleeves. Fabric choices ranged from the sheerest cotton to silk net, satin, and even velvet. Necklines often dropped, and the modest fichu of the daytime was abandoned for jeweled necklaces or pearls. Embroidery styles often echoed the neoclassical elements popular throughout fashion, architecture, and home decor. Indian floral motifs and paisleys were also sought after. When venturing into public, women would wear full dress, which included an outerwear garment over the dress and often included a hat and gloves. Styles included Spencer jackets, pelisses, cloaks, shawls, and short gowns. During warmer weather, Spencer jackets were common. They were generally long sleeve jackets that stopped at the Empire waistline, but sleeveless versions were worn on occasion. These often closed with hooks or a belted waist. Some were cut to hang open and not close at all. Fitted full-length coat varieties included the police, red and goat, and riding habit. 
which was more of a Spencer and skirt combo. These coats were often adorned with piping, metallic braid, or fur. Unfitted cloaks were also popular during inclement weather and while traveling. The mantelette began to gain popularity as a shorter version of the cloak pulled over the head. Shawls were also a common item used to add additional warmth to Spencer's or to wrap over a dress's bodice. Open gowns added style or warmth while still displaying the gown below. These were paired with white day dresses to take them into evening wear. The short gown or short jacket is a simple garment often worn by working class women over a dress or paired with a skirt. They are similar to the Spencer but have a short skirt attached at the waistline, often extending to the natural waist or hip. Now that we've discussed a little of the history of the fashion of the 19th century, let's discuss what we can do to build your wardrobe. I recommend starting with the essentials, either an empire line dress or a short gown and skirt combination, some form of outerwear, perhaps a spencer or a cloak or a shawl, and acceptable shoes. These can be as simple as black ballet flats. From there you can begin to build your wardrobe by adding in the appropriate undergarments to provide the correct silhouette. A petticoat goes miles in achieving that Regency look. Finding appropriate footwear fitted outerwear, or a neck filler. Perfect things to shop for when attending events are hats, gloves, reticules, and fans. Adding in period appropriate undergarments, footwear, and accessories all add to the aesthetic and really help pull your persona together. I will share a list of great vendors and websites to check out if you want to purchase any of these items. Or if you'd like to make some of the garments yourself, there are a number of patterns available that are accurate to historic garments. Whether you are looking to build or begin your persona, there are a number of resources that you can find online to research what fashion was like at the time. I personally love to look for paintings and portraits, as well as fashion plates, and especially extant examples for museums or auctions. Finding portraits from the era provides a great example of how outfits were pulled together and what hairstyles and accessories were worn with them, when it was appropriate to wear them, where they would wear them, who they would wear them with, all of these wonderful things come to life. Um, beyond just looking at a single garment. Fashion plates and prints also provide an excellent resource for fashion as well as patterns and colors. Many of the fashion plates available online came from France. They're documented and dated and provide a great example of how outfits were put together. I wouldn't shy away from looking for examples in France or Europe. The Napoleonic Empire and, and British Regency heavily influenced American fashion as much of the especially upper class garments were still being imported at this time. If you're looking to construct a garment, I highly recommend checking out auction houses to see extant examples. They often have fabulous photos which show great detail of the inside of garments, how they were constructed, and details such as trims and stitching. Museums also offer photographs of many dresses of the time period. In the case of the Met Museum, you can search by geographic location, you can sort by era, you can sort by date, so you can really hone in exactly what you're looking for and be certain that it's specific to the time period that you're wanting to reenact. Other great museums include 
the Museum of Fine Arts Boston and the VA Museum. Um, I'm sure that you can find many as well if you look. Finally, another great resource online for finding inspiration is Pinterest. It's a perfect way to collect ideas and to see what others find interesting and fashionable. I have a board of Regency wear that's got subcategories of all kinds, um, including this one, which is uh, fabric prints from the time that give a sense and idea of what prints might be appropriate if you're looking for a broadcloth to make your own day dress out of. Thank you for journeying through history in the eyes of fashion with me tonight. I hope that you've enjoyed learning some new things um, and that maybe you found some inspiration yourself. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'd be happy to discuss any of these things with you.